Hello. Let's see. Okay. People are starting to come in. Welcome to the second week. There's pe people are still coming in. Okay, let's see. There's not a waiting room anymore, is there? I think everyone's in here. Okay. Um, let me start by asking anybody have any questions. Remember, you have a homework assignment that's due this evening. If, if the main point of the homework assignment is for you to get Java working on your computer at home. If you have, does anybody have any question about it right now that you know, it'd be good for the whole class to, is there something to, to bring up? Has anybody had any trouble submitting the homework assignment on Brightspace? I got it working on, um my um, Mac and my PC. Okay. Uh -huh. In general, are you going to be doing most of everything on PC? Because then I can, I can just do it on PC while I watch this on my Mac. It doesn't matter. Uh, the, one of the beauties of Java is that you can use it, you can do it on a PC or a Mac. And Dr. Java works on both. So it's, it's I'll always be using a PC because that's the kind of, that's, that's the machine I'm sitting at right now. So um, I'll always be doing things on a PC, but and, and sometimes the instructions I give you will be more about a PC than a Mac. A, a real good thing for you to do is just learn both. You know, if you have both in front of you, switch between them you know, okay. and, get, and get used to both of them. Okay. So you can, you, you can, whichever one you feel more comfortable with, you can do the most work with, but you know, try to switch between them. But we'll, I'll use a PC in class because that's the machine I'm sitting in front of. Okay. Anybody have any question about, especially about Brightspace? Uh, was there any? Any issue with submitting the, because this is the first semester we've used Brightspace, so I'm not even all that familiar with it. But does anybody have any issues about submitting a homework assignment to Brightspace so far? Actually, yeah, I do have a question. Um, I submitted my homework a while back, but it doesn't show, it says zero files to submit. Uh, did it go through? Oh, that's a good question. Send me an email and I'll check. I, I, I have to learn how to even check this stuff. I, okay. I don't know yet what, you should see a confirmation. When, after you submit your homework, you should get a confirmation from my understanding. See, I'm, one problem is I'm a professor, not a student, so I don't get to see this from the student's point of view. So I look at the, I just kind of read what Brightspace says, and they, they say you should get a confirmation, but I don't know what you see after the confirmation. Now, if, you're, if you have a question, send me an email and I'll look on my side of Brightspace and I'll tell you, I can tell you whether it's there or not. So, okay. Yeah. I, I, I'm looking through my email. I see the confirmation. It yeah. And that's through. still, but that, you know, that, that, that's the, that, yeah, that's one thing to look for. And then if you want, send me an email and I can check on my end to make sure that it did appear there the proper way. And it, it, yeah, I have, they haven't been graded yet. So no, nobody's got a grade yet in their, in the grade book. They'll, they'll get graded hopefully in the next few days. So uh, I should see your homeworks, but I haven't, but I, I, I'll see them in what I need to grade. So I can tell you whether it's shown up there or not. I mean, they're not due till this evening. Yeah, they're due, they're actually due, I think at midnight this evening. Okay. And if, if, if you have questions about submitting it, you know, it, you know please, please send me an email and ask. I, I, I gave, um, in the page on submitting homework, I, I, I put a link to a little video that the Brightspace people created, which seems to help. Okay. All right. Anybody else, any other questions about the homework or about stuff so far? I'm going to switch to screen sharing. So you can see my desktop. You should see my desktop now. Okay. All right. So here's the entry for today. There's a, now there's a, it says here, you see the program assignment page for your next program assignment. It's, it'll be up there later this afternoon. I was, I've been, I was writing it this morning and I'm still editing it. So it's not quite there yet. So, so this page isn't there yet. It'll be there later this afternoon. 
Okay, so that'll be your second homework assignment to do a week from Wednesday. We don't actually have class. If I'm if I'm honest now, right, Monday is Labor Day. Uh, a week from today is Labor Day, so there there won't be class a week from today. I think. Okay, so the homework assignments due a week from Wednesday. So and then here's another reading assignment to re start reading chapter three in this book. Okay, and also uh, okay, chapter three is about something called the scanner class, okay? And in the other textbook, there's also a section about the scanner class. So I gave you two readings. This one you've actually may have read already, but see, there's the uh, information about the scanner class. So this is another section about, it's how to get input from a user. We'll start talking about that a little bit today. So there's both, each book has a section about the scanner class. Uh, this was already assigned reading, you may want to read it over again and compare it to this chapter three here. So chapter three here is about scanner and section 1.46 in this book is about scanner. Scanner is the thing you use to, as we'll see, to read input into your program from somebody typing at the keyboard, okay? So we're gonna talk about that a little bit later today, okay? All right, so that's your, reading assignment is to read about the scanner class okay so you're reading about the scanner class okay and what we're going to do today is talk a little bit about these sections 1.3 and 1.4 and start talking about the scanner that's what we'll do today okay so here's one of the this here's a reading assignment for today and I, what i want to do is start by just going through this and make sure everybody feels comfortable using this book this book is, has a lot of problems built into it that I think are very good. So I want you to, to think about the problems as you do them, you know, do the problems as you're reading the book. So for example, um, I mean, here's the first one. What type would you use to represent an average grade in a course? Now we've talked about ints, doubles, booleans, and strings. We've talked about four kinds of, of data types. Ints hold integers, whole numbers. Doubles hold fractional numbers, decimal numbers. Booleans hold only the value true or false. So you can only, yeah, the book talks about how you can only hold the, the, so, uh, uh, the yes or no answer. It's a variable that just holds essentially a yes or no answer, true or false. And then string holds messages. Okay. Now, suppose you want to hold the average grade of someone. You know, an average grade, even if you're averaging grades like quizzes and the scores are seven, eight, nine, you probably need a double to hold the average because the average of a four and a five is 4.5. Okay, so you pick which one you think is the right answer and you say, check me and they'll tell you right. Okay, now if you make, if you guess the wrong answer, they tell you wrong and they give you a little bit of information. Okay, so this is, this is, this is a way to just keep up with reading. It, it, it's a way to it, think about what you've just read. It isn't grading you in a sense that, you know, you, there's no record made of what you ch click on these, but answering these questions as you go along is a really good way to make sure that you're following the material. So if you get it wrong, they give you an explanation, which is good. You know, and then you can always go back and redo it and, and see, no matter what, if you check a wrong one, they give you a little hint about what's wrong with it. Like, you know, suppose you want to represent the number of people in a house. Well, we don't have, okay, we don't have half people, so double's not likely to be needed. You could use a double, but it wouldn't necessarily be needed. You only have whole numbers of people in a house, so integer's a better answer. Boolean's not a good answer because Boolean would only tell you you have one person or nobody in the house because it's only, can only say true or false. String is actually, you could hold a string with a number 10 in it, but that's not a good way to say, I want to record the number of people in the house. Okay, notice that it's not really, let's see what they say about check me, okay? Well, see, notice they say, while you can use a string, see, they admit you could use a string, a number is better, because you can't add strings, you can't divide strings. You know, so if you had four people in the house, you could use the string quote for quote, Okay, but you'd be better off using the int for four. Okay, so notice that, notice that even they're pretty good about answering these. Even when this is wrong, they point out that, well, it's wrong, but it's not 
100% wrong. You could use a string, but a, now again, a double's not wrong either, because you know, if you have four people in the house, 4.0 tells you how many people in the, have in the house. It's just that you don't really need the double. Can you click check me? Now, oh, no, they, see, I, I don't think that's a really good answer. Can you have 2.5 people in the house? Well, that's not really the issue. Can you have 2.0 people in the house? Sure you can, but int is really the best answer here, okay? Number of people is a whole number, so use integers, okay? So I think their, their answer for double could have been a little bit better because it just like string could be an answer, and they say that you can use a string, you also can use a double, but there's a chance that you make, you, you, you know, the trouble, the, one nice thing about int is it forces you to have a, a correct kind of answer. You can't accidentally have 2.5 in an int. If you're using doubles to count people, you could accidentally have 2.5 in your double. So that leads to possible errors where int would prevent that kind of an error. That, that's what makes int the best answer, okay? So these problems ask you to think if you get them wrong, you might even look at what their wrong answers are just to see what they say about them, okay? What type would you use to hold the first name of a person? Well, th this one's not hard at all. There's no issue here. You can't hold a name in an int or a double or a Boolean. It has to be string, okay? All right, so that's one. Notice that these are just multiple choice problems. Occasionally, they have problems where you have to type in an answer, okay? What type should you use for a shoe size, like 8.5? Well, here, you want to type in the name of a type. Like I could say, well, what about int? And yeah, you know, what type allows for decimal numbers? Well, decimal numbers are double. So you have to type out the word double. If you misspell it, you know, notice that check me didn't really, yeah. You know, if I get, type it correctly, correct. Okay. So some of the problems are short answer. Okay. All right. Now, let me, now some problems actually are code. Let's look at an example of this, okay? Run the program to see what is printed, then change the values and run it again. Click the show code, okay. So actually, this isn't really so much a problem as they just want you to see how their code works, okay? Now, if I click run, their code compiles and runs. And the gray box here is the output from their program, okay? So for example, I can change score to be six and I run it. And score is six now, okay? So I see a different output. Now it says here, change the values, run it again. Now they say, click on code lens. Well, okay, there's this button here that says code lens. Now right now, the output looks like this. There's the code that you can modify, it's output. This part here, in most of these, when they're problems, this is the part that tells you whether you got something right or wrong. So if it's a problem that you're trying to solve, you'll put your code here, you'll get the output from your code here, and here will, they'll tell you whether you got things right or wrong. Now, if you click on code lens, you get something that's real interesting. You get to watch your program run. Now, the code lens shows up down a little bit farther down. The code lens lets you watch your program run. It lets you step through your program. So for example, this little arrow says that my program's starting at line six. And then I click next, okay, click next. And that created a variable. Notice that my, this code lens lets you watch your program execute. So it lets you see that when you got to line six, you put the number six, in a variable called score. Now see if I go backwards, now I'm at line six. See, main means I'm in the main part of my program. Six means I'm at line six of main, okay? When I click next, it happens. When six happened, well, now I'm at line seven. And what happened is the variable six got the value six in it, okay? Right, now, I, now line seven is about to happen. If I click next, line seven printed output, that shows up over here. Your code is here, your output's here, and here are your variables, okay? This shows you how the, your program is changing its variables. Like here, I'm about to create a variable called price, okay? 
Notice this is more information that's shown up here. Here you've got your code and the output. That's it. When you click run, the program just runs and all the output appears. When you click on code lens, you get a little bit more detail. You see your code and you could then, you get an arrow that says where in the code you are. You get to step through your code, watch it run. The outputs appear here and your variables appear down here. So now I'm about to create the variable price. Okay, so there's the variable price and it holds 23.25. Okay, I'm about to do line seven. See, I'm now, I'm sorry, line 10. I'm now at line 10 in main and I'm about to do line 10. And that showed some output up here. Okay, notice that programming is about watching a whole bunch of things at once. Yeah, you know, there's a button down here that makes me step through code over here, which shows up output over here and changes variables over here. And uh, we, we use a tool like this because this is the mental model you want to build up when you see this. When you see this and you click run, eventually you're going to become good at b building a mental model that thinks, whoa, I stepped through this code. This thing happened, and this thing happened, and this thing happened, and this thing happened, and this thing happened. And while they were happening, variables were being created, output was appearing. You know, and then programs are movies. You know, this is down here. So, you know, you have like a little button to play, like step through this uh, scenes of a movie. You think of programs as things that happen in time. You step through them in time. You know, program code happens one after the other. So this code lens is a tool for you to build up this sense of how programs work. Okay, now if I keep stepping through here, I'm at line 12. See, I'm at line 12, I'm about to do line 12. Line 12 is gonna create another variable. This one's a Boolean kind of variable. Okay, so variable one holds the value false. Okay, and then I print it out. Okay, then I change the value of one. Okay, line 14, see line 12 created the variable, line 14 is going to update it. So now when I click for this next, I'm going to see what's in here change. See, change to true. If I go, I can go back, whoops, oh, let's see. You can go forwards and backwards. Um, not sure. I thought previous was supposed to only go one step backwards. Looks like this time, I'm not sure. Usually when you click the previous button, you just go one step backwards. This is going all the way back to the beginning. I'm not sure why. Maybe there's a little glitch in this one. Usually when you click next, you go one step forward. When you click previously, you go one step backwards. And this one's going all the way back to the beginning. Okay. I think that's a little glitch in this, this example. Okay. All right. Oh, and what do we do when we get to the end? Okay. Now, 14 changes true to 15 see 15 is not quite the end of the code 15 prints out one more line out here then there's one more variable notice we're creating one kind of each variable an int a double a boolean and a string okay so that created a string variable and then printed it out okay notice that we're at the end of the program when you get to 19 you're at the well actually when you get to the end, when the arrow goes away, we've got to the end of the program. Okay. All right. So that's the code lens. The code lens only shows up if you click on, let's see, you have to, let's see, you can hide the code, code lens. I guess they thought it took up too much space in the, in the web page. So they, because it does take up quite a bit of space, they make you, they allow you to show it and hide it. Okay. This part's always there, the code, the output box and the results. Now this one didn't have any question. Now let's look at one where you have to solve a problem. Oh, let's see, look at, here, here's another kind of problem. Click on all the variable declarations in the following code, okay? Okay, here's a variable. Notice that when I click on something, it highlights, okay, right? And if I click on it again, it unhighlights. Here's a variable, check me, incorrect. That wasn't a variable declaration, that was where a variable got its value, okay? So that's a variable declaration. That's saying, I've got a new variable called int. Now check me. Well, incorrect. Well, there actually says one, you only found one of three declarations. So look down here, there's a, another declaration 
that gives it a value that prints it out. Oh, there's another declaration. See the declaration used the types. So there's a variable name. So this is an integer variable. This is a double variable. This is a Boolean variable. Check me and you get correct. Hey, that's a nice kind of a problem. You, know, you and you click on, they, they ask you a question about the code. You have to read it. You don't change any of the code, but by clicking on lines, you can answer the code. Now here they ask for something a little bit different. Check on all the variable initializations, not the declarations, but where the variables get their first value. So here is a line that declares a variable, then this gives it its first value, okay? You clicked one of the three correct elements, okay? Now, I want initializations, not declarations. Now this one, this is important. This one's both. It's both a declaration and an initialization. Since I'm supposed to click on all the initializations, I should choose this one. This one's just an initialization. The declaration's on a separate line. This one combined the initialization with the declaration. So does this one. This one combines the initialization with the declaration. That's not an initialization. That's changing this variable here, and that's changing this variable here. This one's an initialization because this value, this one didn't have a variable, a value. So notice that this one's an initialization, but this one's not. Notice you have to you have to read these in context. That is not an initialization because the variable already had a value, so that's an update of the variable. So check me, you're correct. Now notice if I click on this one, check me. You clicked on three or three correct answers and one of the 14 incorrect elements. See, so see, notice they, they, they color code this one to show you that that wasn't, wasn't proper, okay? So they give you a hint, good, 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 wrong. And what was wrong was that wasn't an initialization. It was an, we call it an assignment. It updated the variable, okay? Okay, now let me show you another kind of problem that, that, that's in this book that's real common. These are uh, program, uh, pro puzzle problems where you have to rearrange the code to be in the right order. They have a bunch of lines of code over here and you have to put, you have to drag and drop them over here into the right order. Some of the code isn't actually gonna be used. So you have to figure out which lines of code belong over here to solve this problem, okay? The following code declares and initializes variables for storing a number of visits, a person's temperature, and the person has insurance or not, okay? It also has extra blocks that are not needed. Okay, so they want you to drag needed blocks from the left area to the you know, to the area here in the right order. Okay, it should declare a variable. Okay, okay. You want the number of visits, a person's temperature, and if the person has insurance. Okay, so okay. Now here's num visits. Okay, now what's the difference between this one and this one? Which one of these is right? Int num visits equal five, int num visits equal five. Which one is the right one for declaring a variable? The one with the, uh, uh, with the small i. Yeah, the, the lower, you, capitalization matters in Java and you don't use uppercase i for int, you use lowercase little i. So there's, I want the, the declaration of number of visits. Okay, and then they did kind of the same thing with temperature. They've got it misspelled with a capital D and spelled with a lowercase d. So there's the, num yeah, the, the number of visits, the temperature, and then they did the same trick with Boolean. They, they, they misspelled it with a capital B and spelled it with a lowercase b. That's the right one. Okay, now you think that's what they want, so you say check. Okay, perfect. Uh, now, let me do something. Let me just rearrange these. Check. Didn't say anything. I believe you have to reset. So oh, I can... to, oh, it won't let me check twice in a row. Okay, so hit reset. Now let me put them out there in a in a different order. So I'll put num boolean. Okay. Check. Now so they point out that you don't have them in the right order that they asked for them in. They asked it in the order of 
number of visits, temperature, insurance. Okay, and here it didn't really matter. The order doesn't matter a whole lot, but they ask for a certain order. So they tell you that you have things in the wrong order. Okay, so this should have been, I think this is the right order. Check. Okay, perfect. Notice it, tell, it tells you how many times it took you to get the answer. It took you two tries to solve this. Okay. And then if I do something like uh, number of visits, temperature, has insurance, check. I used the wrong declaration. You know, I, I picked the one that had the capital I. So it tells you an error message. Okay. All right. So there's a bunch of these kinds of problems. Okay. That that uh, that have you think about the code on the left. And they'll 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 you know there's there's two things you have to kind of do. You have to pick the right lines of code and and skip the wrong lines of code that aren't needed. And you have to get them in the right order. Okay, so there's lots of problems like these. They're very good problems for thinking about uh, programming. These are really good problems. And you know, again, you'll always be, they'll always have help. They'll always tell you about, oh, actually, there's also a help me button where you can get a little bit of a, of a hint up here. Okay, okay. All right. Now, um, So mostly these are not hard problems. If, you know, if you went through this, you may have found them pretty easy. They will get harder as we go on in the book. Like right now, the main thing is I want you to see how to just use these things, how to use these problems, okay? Um, let's do one more, let's do this one because I think this is one where you actually have to do something. Uh, no, uh, I want one that has actually a question where you have to solve it. Okay, add a print statement to concatenate the string literal favorite color is with the value stored in red. Okay, now say they got a variable called red and they want to print out favorite color is red, but they don't want this in a variable. What they mean is they this. So system dot out dot print line that prints something. Okay. Then I'm going, to print, I'm going to print something and put a semicolon at the end. Now, what do I want to print? I want to print, according to them, this message. Since I don't feel like typing, I'll even go ahead and I'll see if I can copy and paste that. So they want that message, copy, paste. Favorite color is, now I don't want to put red here. That's what they want, but they want you to use the variable that holds red. So favorite color is color, okay? But to get the output to have this, what's in this variable come after this string, you have to add the strings together. So you have to put a plus there. So now you're printing out favorite color is plus color, color holding red. Now let's see if I did that right. Click run, okay? Bad characters in activated window. Oh, it didn't like my cut and paste. Oh, I see. My cut and paste, you know, I tried to cut and paste from up here. You'll find as you do this, that uh, characters that look like characters aren't always the same thing. This looks like a double quote up here, but it's actually a different double quote than this one. So I need to do this. I need to go over down here and put in the right kind of double quote from my keyboard and go over here and put in the right kind of double quote from my keyboard. So it's kind of a funny thing. I tried using a cut and paste. And because of weirdness with fonts, sometimes two letters can look alike, but they're really not the same letter because they come from different fonts. So now I can click run. Okay. Compiling, running. And now let's see. I passed their test. Okay. See, I passed their test. Now, let me, let me not pass their test. Let me do something that would be cheating. I'll get the right output. Okay, I passed one of their tests, but I didn't pass another. Now, what did I pass? Okay, look real carefully. What did I do right as far as they're concerned so far? The right output. Yeah, I, I'm printing the exact right output. So I got that correct. But what did I fail? 
You didn't use the string variable? I didn't use their variable that they told you to use. I got the right output, but I didn't get it the way they wanted you to get it. So I passed part of their test and failed part of their test. Okay. So so now I can go back and fix it. You know, the way it was supposed to have been was. Okay, try running it again. Okay. Okay, now here's a mistake in their part. Did I pass their test? Yes. Did I though? No. No, because what's my output? Uh, is red. <laughs> yeah, I, I purposely put a little goof in there. I, I deleted this space at the after the is, is red is all run together. I'm not sure why they said I passed. I don't know if, it, if it's because I uh, at one point did it right. Okay, it's not the right output. So sometimes there's little code glitches even in their stuff. I mean, I'm close to the right output, but um, I should have, um, I should have a space right after this. See, you can see here, it ran these words together. Let me run it again. Yeah, I'm still passing. Okay, we'll see what happens if I put. Oh, uh, well, actually, let's try something funny. Okay, so their automated testing systems got a few glitches in it. Okay, um, what if I could even delete one of these words? Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure why this one is doing such a bad job of checking the outputs. I think okay. because it's trying to make sure that you're both using a like printed word and also the variable. So maybe that's why it's still passing. Yeah, it's just, it's it it not. Notice that my expect notice the expected output is not the actual output. Okay, so I, I think it's just a little bug in their code here. You know, they say right here. The expected output is this. They're probably really just checking for this. So I think, yeah, I think they're really just checking for this one over here, which is the more important thing that you use the variable. And they maybe just actually forgot to check for the actual output. It might even be that they forgot to check. I mean, you can do something extreme. So we're only using their variable. Okay. Favorite output is red. The actual output is just red. And so I think they actually forgot to do this test. I think they're actually maybe forgetting to do that test and are only doing the second test. Okay. Now, so hopefully there won't be too many places where things are, 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 are a little bit mistaken like this. Okay. But, you, but these are good programming assignments. These are actually very good ways for you to build up practice with Java. Okay. All right. So, but that's the way you would do these things. You, you, oh, and if you, when programs, when, when the problems get harder and you're not getting the right answer, that's when the code lens can be useful so that you could see exactly what your program is doing step by step. The code lens is the way we say we can use for debugging programs. When a program isn't doing what you think it should be doing and you're not sure why it's doing the wrong thing, sometimes watching it step by step by step will show you where you made a mis mistake. So that's when the code lens would come in. When you're getting the wrong answer, but you don't understand why you're getting the wrong answer and you want more information. Okay. All right. Now let's, uh, let's go to a section in the, let's go to the next section of the book. The next section was section 1.4. I want to show you some more examples. Okay. In this section, I want to talk about this modulo operator. In class the other day, we did this thing on variables. Okay. And let's see. Oh, we didn't do it. Oh, okay. Yeah, we want to do something. We, we did. 
I want to go back to this stuff on variables and do something that we didn't do. And then what it is, is it's forgot to show you some things about the division operator. Remember we said that when you have doubles and integers, you can do arithmetic, okay? And you can do arithmetic with addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Division is funny in programming languages. That's this thing called the modulo operator. Java and C++ and programming languages have three kinds of division. There's three kinds of division. So I want to show you the three kinds of division. Okay, so um, let me, okay. Let me show you real quick what I mean. I'm going to delete this and just do some examples here. Then we'll go back and look at what they're saying over here. Okay. Great. So um, I can have uh, an integer variable A, make it say uh, five and an integer variable b and make it two, okay? And then I can do – oh, remember, uh, actually, I, I, want, I don't know if I, I – in this book, we were using the code lens. The code lens actually is this guy. They use a version of the Java Visualizer. The code lens is the Java Visualizer. I don't know why they don't call it visualizer, they, but they, oh, these people call it code lens. It actually is, if you go down here and say, uh, what do I have? let's see, there. You, if you look at this code lens, it's what you get when you visualize your Java program, okay? So this and this look a lot alike, okay? This is a version of the Java visualizer. So they just call it code lens. So we'll be, we're going to be using the Java Visualizer a lot, and we're going to be using their code lens, which is the same thing as the Java Visualizer, okay? So I created two variables. What's A divided by B, okay? Turns out that that's not quite so simple, okay? What is 5 divided by 2? Well, even Google can do that for you. Yeah, Google, if you ask 5 divided by 2, you get 2.5, okay? What about Java? What's it going to give us? Step through our program. There's the variable A, which is 5. There's the variable B, which is 2. Print out the answer is 2, not 2.5, okay? Notice that we didn't get the same thing Google got. 5 divided by 2 is 2.5, but Java said it's 2. That's because this division here is what we call integer division. This is an integer, and this is an integer. And Java does, when you give it integers, does what's called integer division. Okay. Now, if I switch these to doubles, oops, go back to the code. If I make these doubles, and then I run it, Notice that now A is 5.0, not really 5, because I said A is a double. So 5 is really stored as 5.0, 2 is stored as 2.0, now 5 divided by 2 is 2.5. So now this agrees with, with Google, okay? Notice I didn't change this symbol here. What I changed was the kind of number on either side of that symbol, okay? There's two division operators in Java. There's integer division and decimal division. If you put two integers on either side of the division symbol, you get integer division. So let me go back up here and let me start changing some things. Int a one, int b one. Okay, now double a2 equals 5, D-O-U. So here's a version that's using ints and a version using doubles, okay? Okay, so here's A1 divided by B1. And here's A2 divided by B2. These are the double, this is int, and this is doubles. 
Okay, now funny thing is, this is the same symbol here, but it has different meaning. Here, this guy means integer division. Here, this guy means decimal division. What if I mix things up? What if I do an A1 on top and a B2 on the bottom? So that is int divided by double. Or I could do double divided by int. I could do A2, which is the double, divided by B1. So that's double divided by int. Okay. All right. What's going to happen here? Notice I'm using the same division symbol. This is int, int. This is double, double. This is int divided by double. This is double divided by int. What kind of answers am I going to get? Well, let's go ahead and visualize it. Okay. Okay, there's my four variables. Int, int, double, double. Okay, 2, 2.5, 2.5, 2.5. Okay, so here's the rules of Java. There's two kinds of divisions. The symbol, this symbol actually can represent two kinds of division, what we call integer division and what we call decimal division. Your calculator always does decimal division. And in a calculus or an algebra class, you only have decimal division. But it, we'll see as we go along that there's a good reason for programming languages to have an integer division. What integer division is really doing is something you learned about a long time ago. In this case, it's asking, okay, so what we're doing here is five divided by two. I can't edit this. So I'm really doing five divided by two. And this one was 5.0 divided by 2.0. And this one is really, it's really five divided by 2.0. And this one is, Five point zero divided by two. Okay, all right. When there's an integer on both sides, you get integer division. Otherwise, you get all these other three are the same. They are decimal division because there's at least one decimal number on in there. When there's two integers, you get integer. What it is is it's ask it's asking the question: How many twos are in five? How many whole twos go into five? And the answer is there are two twos in five and there's a unit remainder because two times two is four and then there's one thing left over, okay? So if you cut up five, if you have five of anything, you can lump it into two groups of two and you're left with one left over, okay? So that's what this is asking. It's asking how many twos go into five. So for example, um, if I change this to nine, okay, how many twos go into nine? Okay, so you can do one, two, three, four, two. You can do four groups of two in a nine, and then you have one left over. So nine divided by two, integer division would be there's four twos and nine. So if I visualize this, see, there's four twos and nine, but nine divided by two on a calculator is gonna give you 4.5, okay? So Java has this kind of division called integer division, okay? Now there's even another kind of division. Okay, let me go back to uh, five here. If I can ask how many times does two go into five here, the answer is twice with one left over. Can I ask for the leftover? The answer is yes. So that's, I'll do that down here. Here's another division operator. Okay, it's kind of funny. Use the percent symbol. 
why would you type percent symbol to mean division? And the answer is because there's a little slash inside the percent symbol that reminds you that it's meant to be something like this division. Okay, this is really quirky. We need a, this is now what the book is talking about, something called the modulo operator. Okay, this percent symbol is the the modulo operator that is talked about over here, okay? It's, it's the companion to the integer division. The integer division says, how many times does two go into five? This would say, so now I'm typing five modulo two. This is asking what's left over after you put as many twos into five as you can, okay? So it's the remainder. It's also often called it's got a, yeah, it's got a bunch of different names. It's also called the remainder. After you divide five into groups of two, what's left over that doesn't fit in a group of two? That's the modulo, the remainder. So if you have five apples, you can pair them into two pairs and you get one left over. Okay, so we visualize this. When we get to the last line, this one's going to print out one. Okay, now let's do something. Let's do this with some different numbers. Instead of five and two, let's do 11 and say three. Okay, so now I've got 11. How many threes go into 11? What's 11? divided by three. What's 11 divided by three? What's 11 divided by three? And what, what's the remainder? If I take 11 apples and put them in groups of three, what's left over that doesn't fit in a group of three? Okay, All right. So now, how many threes go into 11? If you have 11 apples, how many groups of three apples can you make? Three. Three, so you can make, <clears throat> so 11 divided by three in integer division is three. But 11 divided by three is, well, it's really three and two thirds. So this will give us three and two thirds, which is gonna be a decimal number. Notice that you can write the, you can think of the answer as three and two thirds, or you can think of the answer as 3.6666666 forever. You know, and Java is gonna write it the decimal way. And then here, this is asking for remainder. After I've taken 11 apples, lumped them into groups of three, what's left over are two apples by themselves, so the remainder is two. So go over here to visualize, okay? Here's my variables. 11 and three is integers, 11 and three is doubles, okay? How many threes are in three, 11? There's three threes in 11. What's 11 divided by three? Well, it's 11 and two thirds. Uh, notice that it, it's actually supposed to be 3.666666 forever, and the last digit is not right. You'll see that computers don't do arithmetic perfectly. There are issues involving what are called round off error. So notice that the last digit is not actually correct. What should the last digit have been? Seven. Pardon me? Seven. Seven, because when you're rounding, you're supposed to, when you stop at 3.666, you're supposed to round the last digit to the correct place. So it should have been 3.66666 and ended with a seven. So uh, Java, it should have had a five at the end and it should have had a seven at the end. This shows you that the surprisingly, everyone thinks that computers are these perfect things that do everything really meticulously correctly. And the answer is no, they, they do arithmetic in very funny ways. So they make lots of tiny little errors when they do arithmetic. Notice that that error is in the, in, in a, that's a very small number because we're over here in about the, the 16th decimal place. So that's not a big error, but it is an error, okay? And then if I go through here, notice it keeps, you know, now it's doing decimal division because this is a decimal divided by decimal, an integer divided by decimal, a decimal divided by integer, all those give me decimal division. And then I do the modulo, the remainder division. 
This is this other division. So this is the third kind of, remember I said there's three kinds of division, integer division, decimal division, and remainder. What's left over when you do integer division, okay? All right, so Java's got three kinds of division, two symbols, because this one needs a separate symbol. So there's two integer, there's two division symbols, but three operators. And it's actually a real problem that this operator is the same as this operator, because it's a very easy mistake to make to divide two integers, but you really wanted the decimal division, not the integer division, okay? Like, suppose I, I have, um, we could go back to the code. I mean, suppose I just have an integer n equals, say, and I have an integer m, and it's the, and I want to print out I want to know 27 divided by 157, but I don't want integer division. I'm up. Oh, I'm, Suppose I want to divide them, but I don't want integer division. Okay. Now I'm, yeah, if, what's, oh, what did I, I misspelled something. I misspelled that. Okay. When I get down here, Okay. Notice I got zero as the answer. N divided by M is zero. Does that make sense? This is a real easy bug. This bug happens all the time in programs. Does it make sense that that's zero? Why is the answer zero? 157, I'm probably gonna say this backwards, but 157 doesn't go into 27. Yeah, it's bigger than 27. So there are zero groups of 157 and 27. See, remember, the, this is asking how many times does the denominator go into the numerator? That's not what I want here. I wanna know what that decimal number is. Now, Java will do the, you know, that's an int, that's an int, and so Java is gonna do integer division. Okay, now this actually is, there should have been a different operator. There should have been, you know, it's just like the remainder operator has its own symbol. There should have been a different symbol for integer division and decimal division, because there's a lot of bugs here. Here's how you fix this. You need one of these two numbers to be a, de a decimal number, but they're given to you. you, you now, for, let's suppose that I'm not allowed to change these guys here. You know, somebody else wrote this program, this must be an int and this must be an int and I'm not allowed to change them, but I need to know the decimal answer from these divisions. So here's what Java lets you do. This is a quirky thing that the language can let you do. You can temporarily convert this into a decimal number by putting the word double in front of it inside parentheses. Okay. That converts this guy into a decimal number. So you put the word double inside parentheses in front of this number, and it's temporarily converted to a double. Now a double divided by an integer gives me what I want. See the answer is 0 0.1719. See it's a number smaller than one, it's a small number, okay? You see this kind of stuff in people's programs a lot because they have integer numbers. For some reason, they're working with integers, but every once in a while they want to do a division. And it's a very common bug to forget that and then get zero. It doesn't matter which one of these you convert. You could convert the bottom one. That'll give me the right answer because now it's integer divided by double, but integer divided by double gives me, see integer divided by double also gives me a double. So this one will give me the right answer. Okay. 
And some people, to be real careful, will do the same thing on both the numerator. Now, they'll convert both of them to doubles. Okay. All right. Now, why does a programming language need so many different divisions? For example, your calculator only has one division operator. You actually, that's not quite true. Your calculator has all three, they're just not on the keyboard. The other two division operators are buried inside of menus on your calculator. So this division operator does exist on your calculator, but it's not in the keyboard. You can get at it through a, a, a menu item. And this division here, well, this division here, the one that asks how many times did the denominator go into the numerator, okay, the, it's sometimes called quotient. Yeah, this one is called quotient, okay? So if I put this into words, this one's called quotient. And then this one would be called division. And then this one's, the other one's called remainder. So there, if you give them each name, oops, there's quotient, division, and remainder. Those are the three operators. Not everybody uses those words, but quotient being the division of two integers, division being the division of an integer and a, a well, of a, of a, of a double number somewhere in there, a decimal number somewhere in there. And then remainder, when you just want to do the quotient, you want the, the remainder that came after the quotient. Okay. Quotient and remainder go together. And then, then there's division for doubles. Okay. So the quotient operator is in your calculator, but it's buried in a, a menu somewhere. And the remainder operator is in your calculator buried in a uh, somewhere. And division operator uh, is the one that's defaults on your calculator. Uh, Google, I don't know if Google knows the, the remainder operator. Oops. Yep. So 11 remainder three. Oh, and then see how Google wrote it. 11 modulo three. So that's another word for this operator. Yeah, you know, I'm I over here I called it the remainder operator, but there's people who like to call it the modulo operator. Thus we have lots of words for these things, lots of kind of redundant words. So yeah, you can call it the modulo operator or the remainder operator. You can call it modulo or you can call it remainder. This one's usually called quotient. Now over here, suppose I want the quotient 11 divided by three. I don't know how to tell, I, mean, I don't know if Google has a, if they invented a symbol for quotient over here. Yeah, if I do this, I get decimal answers. Okay, if I do this, I get the modulo remainder operator. I don't know if I can get the the uh, quotient operator. I don't know if I don't know if Google has a symbol for quotient. I not that I don't remember one. Um, let me see. I think some people use. No, they're not. There's a couple of programming languages that use double slash to try to separate the to separate division from quotient. To separate division from quotient, some languages I think use double slash here instead of a single slash. Okay, all right, so it's confusing, okay? It's a problem, okay? And especially uh, becomes a big problem when you accidentally have integer divided by integer, but you want the decimal answer, not the integer answer, okay? Now, why would, you know, let's start looking at some examples of how you would use this, okay? Here, this is a, a real famous example. Suppose I have uh, pennies. And I have 172 pennies. How many quarters is that? How many quarters are in 172 pennies? Well, that's where this these different division things can come in. To ask how many quarters are in 172 pennies is to take 172 and ask 
how many times does 25 go into it? Okay, because that's exactly what you would do. If you had 172 pennies and you wanted to turn them into quarters, you would count off 25 pennies and make it a quarter. Count off another 25 pennies, make it a quarter. If it, you do that as many times as you can, lump the 172 pennies into groups of 25, how many 25s are there in 172? Okay, so then, I can say, That's how tedious this is. I want to write the sentence, there are this many quarters in this many pennies in and you get all the spelling right okay did i spell all that right there are blah blah quarters in that many pennies what did i miss wrong I think you're missing an S. Yeah, missing an S. Now what? I think you have to add a plus sign before quarters. Oh, I forgot the quarter. Yeah, see, notice that's why I like to write code in class because you see what I do wrong and you see that you're, you know, we're all going to make the same kinds of mistakes when we're writing code and you just have to start getting used to like, you know, you get little error messages and you go look for what you did wrong down here. Well, everybody's going to make little mistakes when they write code. Okay, now let me go down to the bottom here. Okay, there's my variable pennies, 172 pennies. Now, if you think about how many quarters are in there, there should be six quarters in there. Okay, so six quarters would be a dollar fifty, and then there'll be 22 pennies left over. Okay, so there's six quarters, and then my output. See, there are six. Oh, see what did I forget? Oh, I forgot to say the word quarters. See, there are six, yeah, and oh, and then I got another bug here. See, what was that, what causes that bug? You didn't put the space in before. Yeah, before. so I, I need a space here in front of pennies, and there are... Quotes above quarters? Or is that what we end up Let's see, there are quarters, quarters in... Penny, let's see, I think I got it right now. There are six quarters in 172 pennies. Okay. No, no it's, it's the, re, the, yeah. And then what's left over? What's the, yeah. Then what's, how many pennies are left over? Well, okay. Now the leftover. Okay, there are, oh, actually, if pennies is my variable for how many pennies there are, I should use it here. Pennies is 172, quarters is that many pennies divided by 25. Then I take that many pennies and ask what's left over when you chop it up into quarters. Okay, so, so there are quarter quarters in that many pennies with what with change oops i forgot a quote with change pennies left over See if I got that right. Okay, I'm trying to notice. Like, you know, notice how this is like getting really long, and it's kind of go back and forth and hard to read. Here's what we really should do: should write this the following way. It maybe not makes it easier to read, but it makes it easier. It won't have it go all over the screen. 
break it up into several lines. Break it up into several lines. There are that many quarters in that many pennies with that many pennies left over. Okay, yeah, this is, unfortunately, th th there's no easy way to read code like this. Now, rather than having a really long line of code that stretches real far out like that, which almost nobody likes, you're, it's considered better style to just kind of break it up, line it up, and just, you know, you, you get used to kind of reading it like this, okay? So this is a little bit better way to print it. Let's see, now let's see if I got my output looking nicely. Click on last, I can just go to the end. There are six quarters and 172 pennies with 22 pennies left over, okay? Now notice how the two operators work. This is a good example of where the, the, the quotient operator and the remainder operator can solve a problem for me. Now, for example, if I want to actually, this is a famous problem, if I want to give change, how would you give change to 172 pennies? Well, first you'd figure out how many quarters to give. Then you'd figure out how many dimes to give, okay? So for example, how many dimes there are, how many dimes would be the change divided by 10? How many tens are in the change? That's how many dimes there will be, okay? Okay, okay. and then I'll call it change two. Change modulo 10 is how many pennies are left over after I do the dimes. Okay, so it's just okay. So now there are 172 pennies, six quarters in 172 pennies. There's 22 pennies left over. There's two dimes in the 22 pennies. And there are two pennies left over after those two dimes. Okay. Notice how by alternating between quotient remainder, quotient remainder, I can go through and, and I now let's see if I start off with a different, like if I start off with 192 pennies. Let's see. Let's start with 100 and Let's start with like 193 pennies. Okay, I have 193 pennies. There's seven quarters in that. There's 18 cents left over. One dime goes into that with eight pennies left over. And now I could ask for the nickels. See, now I could do another step. I could go and say, int equal, let's see, that would be uh, change two divided by five and int change three equals change two modulo five, okay? So now I'm asking how many nickels are there and how many pennies are left over after I put, put it in nickels. This is a good, this is actually a very famous example of what you might do with the modulo and the division operator. You're cutting something up into, you're cutting things up by units and it works out real well to go between, you alternate between division, module, uh, quotient, remainder, quotient, remainder, quotient, remainder. Okay, so I start with 193 pennies. It's got seven quarters with 18 pennies left over. There's one dime in that with eight pennies left over. There's one nickel in that with three pennies left over. Okay, so you can figure out. So now someone's change for 193 pennies would be seven quarters, one dime, one nickel, and three pennies. All right, that's an example of how why we would want these other two division operators, why we would want a quotient operator and a remainder operator. Okay, there, and we'll see other examples as we go along in the course. We'll see other places where 
it's useful to ask sometimes, what's the quotient? What's the remainder? Sometimes the quotient is the right answer. Sometimes the remainder is the right answer. And sometimes division is the right answer. Sometimes real decimal division. But then if you've got ints, to get real decimal division, you have to convert them temporarily. That's just a temporary conversion. Convert it into a double temporarily so that you can do decimal division. Okay. All right. Okay. So let's go back over here. Let's let's look at their example. Okay. So they just uh, they just show you that there is they actually here it's kind of funny they actually only emphasize the remainder the module operator, and I think it's actually kind of a, a little bit of a mistake here that you have to you have to put the module operator in comparison you know with its division operator. You know, it's this pairing of modulo with division, re quotient that's so important. Quotient and remainder together work together. More often than not, when you're using one of these, you're using the other one too. Not always, but very often you use them in pairs, just like that. Whereas over here, they're just doing the remainder operator. Okay, so they're just showing the what, how many tens are in eleven? One. How many fours in three? I'm sorry, not, 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 this is not how many tens are in 11. This is what's left over when you put, yeah, this is the remainder. So when you put one 10 into 11, you get one left over. There are no fours in the three. This is a quirky one. There are no fours in three. So you can't, so you get, and you just have three left over. So when you try to lump three into groups of four, there are zero groups of four and you have three left over. When you try to lump eight into groups of two, you get four groups of two with zero left over. Okay, so there's nothing left over because uh, you can, eight's an even number. Oh, uh, actually the module operator is a quick way to tell when you have even and odd numbers. So if you have an even number and you take it modulo two, you get zero. If you have an odd number and you take it modulo two, you get one. That's actually a real common trick for telling if you have an even or an odd number. It, you just look at the number modulo two and it's if it's zero, even, if it's one, it's odd, okay? Because if it's an odd number, you break it up into twos and then there'll be one left over because that's what it means to be odd number. It has one left over when you've broken it up into twos. Okay. All right. And it's kind of funny that in their section on the modulo operator, they don't even mention the quotient operator, its companion operator. And 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 I, that's why I want you to see over here. Make sure you you remember that this operator. Well, it's really, it's really two operators. It's the quotient operator and it's the division operator, depending on what's either side of it. But when you think of it as the quotient operator, then you think of it as paired up with the remainder operator. Okay. Okay. Um, oh, we, we've run out of time. Okay. What I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to put this up on the website, this example here. I'll put this example up here so you can see the code we worked up on here. And we covered this, these sections that were from the reading from last week. So then on Wednesday, we'll go over this reading here. And remember, you have another homework assignment. It'll be up there pretty soon. It's not up there quite yet. It, you know, if you click on homework page, you know, it's not up there yet. So uh, it should be up there certainly by this evening. Okay. And it'll, and it'll be due a week from Wednesday. Okay. Anybody got any last minute questions? Anybody got a question at all about what we talked about today? Any last minute question? Okay, so look for this example to be up on the course website so you can play around with it. You, know, you can change these numbers and do, uh, you know, do the redo. Notice that by using variable names here, if you change this number here, you find out the pennies, nickels, dimes, and quarters for any amount of change. And it, it, if I had to put 193 here and 193 here, 
every time you change the number of pennies, you'd have to keep changing things here and here. So once you have a variable, it's a good idea to keep using that variable, okay? So reuse variables. That's a good example of reusing a variable. Okay, so I'm gonna, uh, for now, I'm gonna stop the sharing and then I'll go ahead and end the meeting and see you again on Wednesday. Oh, and remember the video for this will be up on the course website later this afternoon also. So this video will be up there if you wanna watch it over again, okay? So I'm gonna end the meeting. See you on, on Wednesday, bye.